by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And, sa- and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he again brings the firstborns into the world, he says, Let all the angels of, the, of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to his son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And the Lord in the beginning, and you, O Lord, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will add, they will all grow old like garment, like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which the angels had, has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Are they not all, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the words spoken through angels provide, proved steadfast in every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and who was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bare witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Can you hear me in the back? The book of Hebrews. I think we read from it often during worship. Some portion or other comes up at least once a month. But at the same time, I don't know how many of us have systematically studied it. Uh, There are couple of difficult passages for those who have not gone in depth and when we look at them separately we get more confused and as a young Christian I was very much confused about some of the aspects and I have changed my ideas over time after I studied the book thoroughly and um, you know I I've been using certain resources in my past and one of them was um, one of the authors that I've used much is F.P. Meyer. So he's got this book, Way Into the Holiest, which is a a study on uh, Hebrews. So I'll be drawing quite a lot from that. Of course, there are lots of things that have got added in the couple of decades that I've been through this book. So, I know there's a lot of um, discussion about the author, whether it was Paul, it was not Paul, who it was addressed to. Um, I don't think we are going uh, going to deal with all that. You can read up on that discussion everywhere. It is enough for us to know that the author is the Holy Spirit. And in these pages, there are things that are applicable to our present day church. This book starts off in English with the word God. In the beginning, God we find elsewhere, right? So here, God. So it talks about God's initiative. And talks about God who at various times and in various ways 
spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets we are familiar with all this at least those who have been those who have been brought up in christian churches maybe you have got bored listening to that but it still is good for us to remember that god spoke in various ways and in various times by the prophets what do we mean some of these were penned down in the wilderness before the israelites enter the promised land some were penned in babylon others in roman prison others in the promised land some in hebrew find aramaic and um, greek you find educated men like paul and then fishermen you have kings and warriors and you have people who have suffered you now all these people came together to write this book but it was not they who wrote it it was god who superintended all that so we say the scripture is inspired and these 66 books of the bible they moved together they floated together they rose and fell fell not as in fallen away but rashim tried to completely blot it out from the face of the earth but it has stood the test of time god has put these books together for us and the fact that they have floated together though it was compiled from different uh, times and periods that itself is enough to understand that it is a divine book there is no other book written over centuries millennia that has actually survived and has this unity of thought but here god who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son the focus here is the son you know there are um, different ways of looking at hebrews one of the most favorite things with um, bible scholars is about greater things and the word greater but i would love to just look at one verse before we go into this that is hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 therefore holy brother brethren partake as of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus we find the word consider later on also in the book but as we start off this letter we find consider the apostle and high priest the initial chapters actually deal with consider jesus the apostle the sent one consider jesus the apostle in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom he may the worlds worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he has he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so who is this son today's worship was beautiful wasn't it it is uh some some days are uh, a bit dry but i thought it was beautiful today don't you agree and we thought about the sun is good to understand what that entails god has many sons right chapter 2 verse 10 was leading many sons the captain of salvation was leading many sons to glory 
So we are also sons of God. And Jesus is also son of God. So what is the difference? Jesus claims that he is the son of God. And if you take John 5, we won't um, run around too much. But if you um, go to John chapter 5, there is the guy that was um, at the Bethesda pool. He finally gets healed and on a Sabbath and all that. And finally, um, Jesus says, my father has been active. And they sought to kill him. Why? Because he equated himself with the father. When we say we are sons of God, we don't. We are children of God. We are sons of God. Daughters of God. We don't equate. There is no divine equality. But Jesus said that. And then they questioned and they, were, they wanted to kill him. But, you know, in Philippians chapter 2, the Lord, we see about the Lord that he emptied himself. He did not count it robbery to be equal to God. But there, in John 5, he does not retract. In fact, he says, what do you know? He has committed all judgment to the Son. And it is at the voice of the son that the dead will rise. He's confidently asserting himself. And in John 10, 30, 31, he says, I and the father are one. I and the father are one. So what does that mean? So the sense that is here is the only begotten son. In a unique way, Christ is God's son. Again, we can have um, the word sons of God is also used to, used about angels. But he is the son in a unique way. To explain that, um, the writer uses two analogies. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. The first two. The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Um, different words are used for the first this version says brightness of his glory. In other versions, you'll come across the radiance or the beam of the glory of God, the shining splendor of his glory, the effulgence of his glory. Okay? What does, it, what does this convey? The rays, the beam. You know, it takes around 8 minutes and 20 seconds for the ray of the sun to travel from sun to the earth. So what we see here now was on sun's surface a few minutes back. And the heat and light we see is far away. The ray is essentially the same composition as the sun. When we talk about the effulgence of his glory, we mean Jesus Christ was the same substance as of God. Now when we talk about that, immediately the thing is, oh, that means it is only part of God, it's not holy God. So the second um, metaphor kicks in. And the express image of his person. Some of the modern translations say the perfect copy. The perfect copy. And now you have 3D printers, right? You can have, I'm not even talking only about the two-dimensional copy. The perfect copy is a perfect copy. 
the express image is just like the seal that is on, on a wax surface in yesterday years is a perfect copy is exactly like that in length breadth what and numerous other dimensions you can imagine about god we don't know who god is but he is the exact image of god that was in human form well we know all these things is the exact imprint and he consists of the same substance as god the father sometimes it is very difficult to wrap our minds around it and we dare not think about it much and even when we use those words we hardly think about it we sing about it um i like one of the songs which puts it uh, very well he is the glorious impossible right the glorious impossible um see the virgin is delivered in a cold and crowded stall mirror of the father's glory mirror of the father's glory and he is mercy's incarnation marvel at this miracle for the virgin generally holds the glory is impossible and towards the end of that song it says praise the wisdom of the father who has spoken to us through his son praise the wisdom of the father who has spoken to us through his son how could these feeble beings who could never ever imagine who god is be communicated what god is what the father is praise the wisdom of the father through which he has made it known to us and as we look at the lord jesus christ we'll just proceed further verse 4 having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they what is a word that is used about angels afterwards they are referred to as winds and flames of fire that is the name given to them but what are the words used about the son here about the lord jesus christ verse 5 you are my you are my son you are my son today i have begotten you okay this is probably uh, this is taken from um, psalm 2 which probably was sung at a coronation of a king king so when the when the father brings a son let's see david uh, brought solomon right coronation of solomon when david says this is um you are my son today i have begotten you does it mean that he was born that day no you are coming into possession of your right today so the father tells the son you are my son today i have begotten you i have given you everything that belongs to you and then i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son son in this respect is never addressed to the angels and come to verse 8 this is actually very interesting to note your throne o god is forever and ever the father addressing the son as as god and also as king your throne which means he is king your throne o god 
I really can't understand how Jehovah Witnesses cannot get this. And then, actually, if you look at verse 10, you Lord, in the beginning, lay the foundations of the earth. He's a creator. And this is actually spoken of Jehovah in Psalm 104, just after the verses um, where we say, he makes his angels, uh, spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. The next verse is this. You learn in the beginning, lay the foundations of the earth. That is about the Jehovah God. So Jesus is Jehovah God. And, you know, being born in a Christian home has its disadvantages. One is that we really do not take time to ponder and understand who God, who Christ is. So he is so superior to angels. You know, in the first century, this, is, this was a revelation. You either accepted it or you went against it. Look at the Hebrews. They would either accept it or they would completely rebel against it. And that thought actually took over the church. In Christmas season, we sing Gloria in Excelsis, in Excelsis Deo, right? Glory to God in the highest. That was, all, that was announced by the angels. Um, there's a historian by the name Pliny, in, uh, a Roman historian. So he writes about... Uh, first century Christians in Asia Minor and he quotes the words of um, Gloria in in Excelsis Deo um, the the words of that poetry so it has come to um, English and actually some section of the Catholic Church still uses it in the refined words and I think that is you know, there's such a lot of things wrong about Catholic Mass, but this is one beautiful prayer. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to his people on earth. Lord, God Almighty, we worship you. Uh, Lord, God Almighty, Father, we worship you, we adore you, we praise you for your glory. You alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High with the Holy Spirit. And it praises the Lord Jesus Christ as one, as in being one with the Father. It was a declaration that they made. And there was a, um, Pliny says that this was a song that they sang every day. So it was kind of the standard morning prayer song. Worship and honor to Christ. Well, I don't want to go into more theology because I know theology, you have our family and you can get more of it. But what does this bring us to? What does this bring us to? You know, as the disciples saw him go up into heaven in Luke 24 they worshipped him and I want to read from uh, F.B. Meyer and no sooner had he passed to his home than there burst forth from the church a tide of adoration which has become wider and deeper with ages the epistles especially the book of Revelation Team with expressions of worship to Christ. And the death cries of the martyrs must have familiarized the heathen mind uh, with expressions of worship to Christ. And the, 
And the death cries of the martyrs must have familiarized the heathen mind with the homage paid to Christ by Christians. Of the worship offered him in catacombs or in their secret meetings amidst dens and caves, paganism was necessarily ignorant. Paganism did not know that Christ was being worshipped every day in catacombs and in caves and dens. But the behavior and exclamations of the servants of Jesus arraigned before heathen tribunals and exposed to the most agonizing deaths were matters of public notoriety. They were notorious. These are senseless guys. And actually there's a, a painting that was unearthed by archaeologists um, sometime in 1900s, I think. Uh, and it says, Alexa Menos adores his God. Alexa Menos adores his God. There's a title there. You know what the picture is? It is a slave in tunic bowing in worship. Before whom? Before a cross. And on the cross there's a human form with a donkey's head. This is what they thought of Christ. But the Christians, you know, you either accepted Christ or you went against it. Now it has become, you know, everywhere. The Western culture, there's, there's a pervading sense of Christ and Christianity. And they swear by the name Jesus or Christ. But the word Jesus Christ meant something else in the first century. It meant that God came down and dwelt amongst us. The early church did not just admire Christ. They adored Christ. In the present day church, hardly ever adores Christ, but it admires Christ. That is the deep sorrow that the present day Christianity has. And again, I'm going to read something here. Is there not a lack in us in our private devotions. Okay, is there? This is a question. And this is the application for us from this. Is there not a lack in us in our private devotions? We are so apt to concentrate on our thoughts on ourselves and to thank the Lord for what we have received. Right? We all thank the Lord for what we have received. For many of us, that is worship. We are so apt to concentrate our thoughts on ourselves and to thank the Lord for what we have received. We do not sufficiently often forget our own petty wants and anxieties and launch down our tiny rivulet until we are borne out into the great ocean of praise which is ever breaking in music around the person of Jesus Christ. And as I was preparing and I came to this and I cried before the Lord. You know, as a young Christian, I always burst forth into praise. And I used to pray while things were in progress out loud in front of people. I think Asha was a bit taken back <laughs> initially yes, with my kind of prayer just uh, yeah, and along with that, there were numerous songs of worship that was always on my lips. I can confess that I've gone back there. And unless we come out of this lackiness in our private devotions. Let me go even beyond and say, some of us just 
takes some printed material with a verse and something, some other story to go with it. And want to call it a day. It's our quiet time. Oh, I've given my portion to the Lord for the day. Where does that compare with the first century Christians? And some of us go beyond and thank him for his goodness. And on Sundays, it is the time to worship and adore. No, every day, in our private devotions, as the other says, we have to launch out from our tiny rivulet into the ocean of praise. And till we do that, our lives will be powerless. Praise is one of the greatest acts of which we are capable. And it is most like the service of heaven. There, they ask for naught. For there they have all and abound. But throughout the cycles of glory, the denizens of those bright worlds fill them with praise. And why should not earthly tasks be wrought to the same music. We are the priests of creation. It becomes us to gather up and express the sentiments which are mutely dumb but which await our offering at the altar of God. In heaven we have nothing to pray for. We have everything that we need and we abound. The only thing that we we can do there is praise and that they do with such a joyful heart. Why not get into that heavenly experience here on earth? Why don't we live that heavenly life here on earth? When the sexually immoral, when the wicked, when they are singing praises to gods of immorality, demons of immorality. Why don't we, why don't we break out into praise and offer worship on behalf of the perishing creation? We are priests. We are called to be priests. Royal priesthood. Let us do our priestly duty. The dignity of Christ. When we look at the dignity of Christ, we will break forth into songs of praise. And we may not be poets. I am not for one. But there are so many beautiful songs. There are so many beautiful psalms. Uh, so many beautiful uh, passages in the scripture which we can memorize and use it or just pray it, pray out loud or in our hearts. As we do this, we become strong in the Lord and we become more aligned to the citizens of heaven. The glory of Christ's office. Okay. Angels are ministering spirits. In office, they are ministering spirits. There are so many things that we can think about in the first chapter itself here about Christ. He is the organ of creation. It says, by whom he, by whom he created the world. By whom the Father created the world. Okay? That we read in uh, Son, whom, um, and in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. He was the organ through which it was created. Then again, He's a sustainer of creation. 
upholding all things by the word of his power do we even understand upholding all things by the word of his power you know when christ was crucified on the cross if he did not uphold that piece of wood would just not have been there the iron nails that pierced him would not have been there it is christ who upheld the creation and those pieces of nails and wood so that he could become sacrifice for us without him nothing exists nothing that is seen or unseen exists he is so much superior he is a sustainer and again the first chapter says let all the angels worship him another office of the angels is to worship him and here uh, as we come down to verse 10 you lord in the beginning lay the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you remain and they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up and they will be changed but you are the same and your years will not fail who is this who is this you christ he laid the foundations of the earth you know when the angels sang as we see read in job chapter 30 and maybe verse 6 7 and the morning stars rejoiced he laid the foundations of the earth the heavens were the works of his hands the heavens are the works of his hands now this will all perish but christ is immutable you will remain but you will remain they will grow old like a garment like a cloak you will fold them up and they will be changed but you are the same and your years will not fail and then he says to which of the angels has he ever said sit at my right hand till i make your enemies your footstool can we find that christ is at the right hand of the majesty this came out again and again and again this morning he is at the right hand of the majesty the aspect that we concentrated was that he was seen to see there but this also means that he is the victor where did james and john want to be right hand and left hand of jesus christ christ is at the right hand of the majesty on high he is reigning supreme till the father makes the enemies his footstool and hands while angels are all ministering spirits and now this brings us to the second chapter compared to the glory of christ angels are you can say nothing now therefore we must pay we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward these angels who are nothing in comparison to god they spoke the words of the law through them it came we find that in various places and every transgression or disobedience was punishable under that so if an administration of the law if the dispensation of the law that came through angels was punished that way how terrible it would be if what came through the eternal god 
meet man if that was neglected that is the question there are two there are a couple of things there so this is also a difficult passage right if we neglect salvation okay believers neglect our salvation and salvation is lost we have heard this kind of arguments here and there no actually this does not speak of that okay, there are a couple of things here it, first it says we must give more earnest heed or we must pay more attention to things that we have heard lest we drift away so there is a drifting away that is being talked about and then here it talks about neglecting salvation neglecting salvation is rejecting salvation if you take um i'll just read it for you john chapter 3 verse 16 is very familiar and so we usually end up not reading um uh, verses 17 and 18 or sometimes we read and we don't pay much attention to that but you know verse 18 says he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already if you neglect this you are condemned there is no other name given among men to be saved you are condemned if you, if you are, if you neglect that you are condemned then there is this drifting away pay attention and not drifting away that can be both to believers and non believers before we go into that there's a beautiful picture that comes up in hebrews you know the song we have an anchor that keeps the soul step fast and sure so okay it probably is based on this we have an anchor that keeps the soul step fast and sure while the billows r- r- roll fastened to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the savior's love you see ships drifting away and then in cap- chapter 2 verse 10 again there is a picture of the captain of salvation right and then talks about the anchor that we have as about the, the anchor of the promise and the oath of the lord jesus christ being melchizedek and priest after the order of melchizedek so it paints a picture of a harbor of a great harbor which is full of peace and calm and quiet and that peace can never be shaken a harbor that is built all the shifting sands have been dug up till it has reached the foundations of the sea on the bedrock with great stones a big sea wall is built up a mighty sea wall is built up and no storm can ever attack a vessel that comes into its shade it is so vast that it can accommodate all the sinners that ever was it can accept mary magdalene with her immorality it can accept the dying thief on the cross at the last moment it can accept paul who says i am the chiefest chiefest of sinners and it can accept you and me into its harbor into that harbor it is great in the scope it can accept everyone and its foundation is great and it has been great in its announcement it was announced by the son himself not announced by the angels and if it is neglected the punishment also will be great but what is more it was great in its cost it was great in its cost in in the 19th century uh, the early part of 19th century there was a there was a there was a kind of a engineering marvel that connected wales and um, and a um and an island called anglesey so it was a very tricky stretch 
to navigate and i think it was around 20 20 25 kilometer stretch and in those days they built a big bridge it came at great cost and it was it has been renewed and all that i think it, it is still there so at the um entrance of that bridge there's a column which lists out the cost that was paid but not cost in terms of money it talks about the cost in terms of those who died building that bridge and as we come to this harbor there is there should be a post sacred to the memory of the son of god who gave his life as sacrifice for the sin of the world sacred to the memory of the son who gave his life it is so great a salvation if he neglected it there's no other escape is there anyone sitting here who has known or heard of the of the sacrifice and has not accepted if you neglect this and go forward in your life your life will be a disaster you know the salvation comes in three different tenses we are all familiar right past present and future the past we have been saved right from the penalty of sin we are being saved from the power of sin we will be saved from the presence of sin salvation here can encompass all the three pay more attention else we will drift away pay more attention else we will drift away you know there are very few people who purposely go away right very few people who purposely go away for again i'm quoting um, the author there the um perfect my for everyone that definitely turns his back on christ there are hundreds who drift from him okay we might see only one person that says no i want don't want christ i don't want christ and go away but there are hundreds who drift away from him okay this can be of people who are in salvation already and drifting away um and in the present tense of salvation struggling because they have drifted away or it could even be people who are being led to salvation but drifted away it is the drift that ruins men the drift of the religious world the drift of old habits and associations which in the case of these hebrew christians was setting so strongly towards judaism the drift of one's own evil nature we talk and talk and talk about since that are prevalent in our church it is the drift it is the drift it is the drift of one's own evil nature always chafing to bear us from god to that which is earthly and sensuous it doesn't happen in a day the young man coming from a pious home does not distinctly and deliberately say i renounce my father's god he finds himself in a set of business associates who have no care for religion and after a brief brief struggle he relaxes his efforts and begins to drift 
until the coastline of heaven recedes so far into the dim distance that he is doubtful if he ever really saw it. It is the drift. Little by little, little by little, taking it easy. The businessman who now shamely follows the lowest maxims of his trade was once upon was once upright and high-minded. He would have blushed to think it possible for such things to be done by him as he has done now. But he began by yielding in very trivial points to the strong pressure of competition. And when once he had allowed himself to be caught by the tide, it bore him far beyond his first intention. The professing Christian who now scarcely pretends to open the Bible or pray, came to so terrible a position, not at a single leap, but by yielding to the pressure of the constant waywardness of the old nature, and thus drifted into an arctic region where he is likely to perish, benumbed and frozen, unless rescued and launched on the on the warm gulf stream of the love of God. It is so easy and so much pleasanter to drift, just to lie back and renounce effort and let yourself go whither the waters will as they break musically on the sides of the rocking boat. But ah, how ineffable the remorse, how disastrous the result. Are you drifting? You can easily tell. Are you conscious of effort, of daily hourly resistance to the stream around you and within? Do the things of God and heaven loom more clearly on your vision? Do the waters foam angrily at your prow as you force your way through them? If so, rejoice! Because you are fighting. You are paying attention. If everything is just music to your ears, you are in the lazy river ride. And that will take us to the storm from which no one can rescue us. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your perfect wisdom in which you accomplished our salvation. How you became man and dwelt amongst us. How you brought your son into the world. And we fall in worship at his feet. Lord, we did that this morning. But we pray that he will make it our constant life, constant song, that we would sing and make melody to you with all our heart, always. Not coming in prayer just with our own wants and needs, or even thanking you for all those small little mercies that we have received. But we would launch out from our tiny privilege that focus on ourselves into the ocean of praise where we come and see you and fall in adoration. Lord, we pray that you would make us people who do the duties of heaven here on earth praising you. That we would be people who have rested from our work and are praising you. Father, we also pray that we will make every effort to pay attention to this great salvation that came to us. That we won't drift away. And as we see in other letters, 
pierce ourselves with many sorrows in this life. And for those of us who have drifted away, we pray that he will help us to come back. And in the lives of each and every one of us, there are moments and there are days when we drift away. Lord, break us up. Help us to be fighters. Swimming against the current. Thank you, Father. In Christ's precious name. Amen. Uh, before announcement, Benji, are you here? Okay. Um, we'd like to pray for the uh, Balot uh, mission trip, those who are going for the Ma- Balot mission trip. All those who are going, can you please stand? Those who are going for the Balot mission trip, all the girls that are going for the Balot mission trip. And there are, there are one or two people f- from elsewhere. Benji, would you come and pray for them? As we pray, let's also commit them um, as a church um, that we will keep them encouraged. We will send the messages. We will keep them continuously in prayer as they go to Balo. Then they will be also visiting Pakanjur um, and also a couple of other places. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for 